Good morning and welcome to our Passion Tide service at St. John's this Good Friday morning. If you're new or visiting, then especially warm welcome. My name is James Smith. I'm the senior minister here. Everything you'll need is on your sheet and in the readings from Luke's Gospel and the anthems and the hymns, we remember and reflect the passion, the suffering and the death of Christ for us, which is why we dare to call this day good. The introit we have just sung has some very striking words. It's based on a biblical text in Luke 7.38 in which a sinful woman comes to the Pharisee's house where Jesus is eating. She brings ointment and stoops and bathes Jesus' feet with te her tears and dries them with her hair. She continues kissing his feet and then anoints them with ointment. Jesus goes on to contrast the lack of water and oil provided to him by his host and by Simon uh, with the sinful woman's gift of bathing his feet with tears and anointing them with ointment. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. Jesus went on to forgive the woman, saying, you're safe. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Well, with that context, uh, we're going to sing uh, the intro again, after which the congregation will stand for our first hymn. And then the remainder of the service, the hymns and the readings will proceed unannounced.
Jesus prays on the Mount of Olives. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond and there knelt. He knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders uh, who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns.
Peter disowns Jesus. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this man was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Jesus before the guards and Sanhedrin. 
The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophecy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the, el- the, council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, If I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied, You say that I am. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips.
Jesus before Pilate and Herod. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You had said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the crowd shouted, away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them. Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder and the one they asked for and surrendered Jesus to their will.
the crucifixion of Jesus. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeremy, if we haven't met. I'm the assistant here at St. John's, and hello to those uh, joining us online as well. If, you've been, uh, if you're returning, or uh, if you're joining us for the first time in a while, uh, where we've been following Jesus through the Gospel of Luke in a series we've called Journey with Jesus. And last week, we saw he had finally come to the gates of Jerusalem, having travelled uh, down from Galilee in a procession as we celebrated uh, Palm Sunday with beautiful palms up here. Uh, and the crowds were yelling, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, today we see a different kind of procession, don't we? Uh, it's in the other direction. It's out of the city, out of the city gates, up the hill to a place called the skull. And the same man who rode into Jerusalem, hailed as king, is now carrying his cross and spat on by the same people who are singing his praises, uh, by the same crowds that only a few days earlier had named him their king, hailed him as their king. And now they mocked him and nailed the title above his head, King of the Jews, ironically. And they crucified him. In their minds, this was Jesus' story. In fact, it was a story about to be forgotten. A failed revolutionary at best, chewed up and spat out by Rome, rejected by the Jewish people, to be erased from human memory forever. Except he wasn't. 
Except somehow, from the very moment he died, the world started changing. There's a strong argument to be made that his death changed the course of history more than any other event ever. So much for erased from human memory. And what about us as well? May we, make no, or may we not make the same mistake. Just like the, Jesus' death changed history, a proper understanding of Jesus' death changes lives. We cannot stay the same. We cannot walk out of the doors the same, having understood Jesus' death. Because Jesus' death is for everyone. That's really my point today. Jesus' death is for everyone, whether you like it or not. It's for everyone. It's needed by everyone. And with that in mind, what I want to do today is look at the three people who, excuse the crude phrase, had a front row seat to Jesus' death. A front row seat to the event that changed history two men, the two men he died with alongside, and the man tasked with his successful execution, the centurion. In terms of sheer physical proximity, the three closest people to Jesus when he died, three people, three different assessments of Jesus' death, two profoundly changed lives and one unmoved. And so let's move to the first man, the mocking criminal. And verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. What a rude thing to say to Jesus. But before we pile on, we we need to take a bit of a step back because this man is making possibly the easiest mistake anyone could make about Jesus. It's a mistake that we can easily make about Jesus and perhaps have. For one, this man is following the crowd. He's simply parroting what everyone else is saying. It's not unique. It's not groundbreaking. Both Jewish religious leaders and the Roman authorities, they never agreed on anything. But they could agree that Jesus was a loser. They could agree that he needed to be squished out of existence, that he is pitiful, weak, and after all, that's what a cross does to you. It's easy to form a position on Jesus that the crowd agrees with. Everyone seems to agree Jesus is pitiful and embarrassing, and it's easy to parrot that, and it's easy to parrot that in our world too. And I want to ask, How have you formed your opinion about Jesus' death? It takes courage and independence of thought to consider it for yourself and not just what the crowd and the culture says. And it takes a bit of humility too. But also, he's making an easy mistake because he's following human nature. Jesus needs to pass this man's test if he's going to uh, acknowledge him. Get yourself down from this cross. Oh, and me. I'll accept you if you get me out of this mess. And if you can't, you're an idiot. Jesus has presented all sorts of other reasons for people to follow him through his life. His compassion, his love, his miracles, his wisdom and his teaching. But no, this man, he wants to get out of a tight spot. The tightest of spots, I must say. I'll follow you if you can be what I need you to be. Human nature is to forge God, remake God in our own image and make demands of him. I have needs and meet them and then you're worthy of my respect. And this actually is a lot of religion. I pay my good deeds and you pay me with favorable favorable circumstances. Or or even if you're not religious, but you're kind of spiritual, you know, the universe owes me. This kind of version of what goes around comes around, whether it's the universe or God or karma, it's our default human position to to project ourselves on God. And you know, maybe one of the reasons that you are frustrated in life, angry or bitter in life, is because according to you, the world owes you. 
God owes you. The universe owes you, like this man hanging on a cross. So we shouldn't be too quick to pile onto this guy. We're all a little bit like him at our worst, or maybe even at our normal, possibly more than we'd be willing to admit. But we don't see a hint of this in the second man hanging on the cross, do we? Oh wait, actually we do. We do. We read this in Matthew's account, Matthew's version of this story. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. See, when this man, the second man, was first crucified, he also was mocking Jesus. But then something happened, something that changed his life from going from mocking Jesus to this in verse 42. We're punished, ju- we're punished justly. We are getting what our deeds deserve. Now, we know from Matthew's Gospel again that these men were insurrectionists. They were Zionists. They were Jewish rebels, uprisers. And they had fought against Rome and they had evidently lost a Jewish rebel. So this man is, is this man saying, ah, I've suddenly realized that the Romans were right the whole time and here I am on a cross justly executed by the Romans. Of course he's not saying that. He's talking about God's justice. Not Rome's justice. He's admitting his own guilt before God. He was able to somehow, after having been just like this man, closed-minded and following the crowd, he is admitting his own guilt. He was able to stand back and see his attitude towards God and the world for what it was, entitled and angry and embittered and violent. And that would put him in a very precarious position before God. And remember, we're a little bit like that too, more than a little bit at times. But notice, this isn't self-loathing. This isn't hopeless self-pitying, woe is me. It's not even groveling. Notice his clarity of mind. To be that self-reflective, to to be able to change your mind on the spot and say, no, I was wrong about this guy. This is freedom from bitterness and anger. It's even buoyancy in hope to stand up for the man that you were jeering five minutes earlier. So what changed in this guy? What changed in him? Because, you know what? I want a little bit of what he found. I'm going to die one day. I want to die like this. Maybe not on a cross, please. But I want to die like this. And so what changed him? Some might expect this kind of admission to come out of a, a good talking to from Jesus. Say, you're wrong about me. You know, thunder in Jesus' eyes, righteous anger for how he's being treated, God hanging on a cross, mocked with... You know, this deserves a rebuke. Uh, You know, at least he needs to be shown how worthy of judgment he is. Repent, you rotten sinners, is what we'd imagine Jesus to say in response. But no, we don't see any of that. In fact, we see precisely the opposite. Uh, Luke writes that after being crucified, in verse 34, Jesus prayed out loud, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Forgive who? Well, forgive the ones mocking and rejecting him, like this man. Think about this for a second. Could this man be in any more of a vulnerable position before God? You're dying on a cross, you're a violent person, you're entitled, you're angry, you're bitter. You're dying in the most painful, dehumanizing way possible. Cursed is one who's hung on a pole of the scriptures, but not just that, you have used your precious final few breaths remaining to yell insults at who? God! It's a bit silly. It's as low as it gets. And yet, it was here that he encountered the very heart of God for him. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. See, the heart of God is this, that as we get worse, he Servant, even more fervently loves. As low as it gets is precisely where God loves to meet us. As 
you know, it's a couple of drugs in but lovingly, the hardest thing for us to get our heads around in life isn't merely that we're guilty before God, and we are more than we think, but it's actually no matter how guilty we are, God's love for us and willingness to forgive us abounds even more. We just think the, the worse we get, the more God's annoyed at us. But actually, it's the opposite. The worse we get, the more God loves to forgive us and inclines to forgive us. And this is what the criminal on the cross discovered as he heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them, as is not. And so this is what the criminal on the cross discovered. And so he turned to Jesus and he asked, famously, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is amazing, actually. Nowhere else, nowhere else in the gospel is Jesus addressed by someone else by his name. Nowhere else. Only here. By this random guy who five minutes ago was yelling at you, I think. This is, an, this is personal. This is intimate. It's not master, not lord, and it's not rabbi. It's Jesus. And Jesus' response is even more beautiful than that. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Not just saying, oh, when I get to heaven, I'll think of you. I'll you know, have you in mind. Along with all the other people, who's going to be there, you, you know. So just beware that I'm, you know. There's a lot of people to get around to. So he says, I will have you with me. From the worst of offenders, the closest of, of brothers. And imagine being there to witness this kind of transformation, this kind of conversation, this kind of redemption. Of course, the obvious application is that if this kind of redemption is available to a man like this, it's available to you by Faith. This man did nothing to deserve it, aside from asking Jesus for forgiveness, for his presence. God's heart is that the worse we get, the more he is inclined to forgive. And that reality won't leave you the same. It did it for the criminal. But nor did it for the man responsible for Jesus' death. You know, it was someone's job to make sure Jesus died that day. And it was the centurion. Now, a centurion in the ancient world was not just a mean kind of brute, but he was someone who had made it in life. Uh, if the criminal was living his lowest moment before he died, this man was living his best life, like the captain of the footy team in high school. They had social power. They were esteemed. They had status. They would have been quite wealthy. They were in charge of about a hundred soldiers or so, and what's more, he was a powerful instrument of Rome. People feared him to defy the emperor, deny the emperor's deity and his power. Well, you're going to die at the centurion's hand. That's the job of the centurion. He would have been directly responsible for the task of crucifying these three men this day. Make sure they die. That's his job. Uh, just another day at the office. He was responsible for the operation. It would have been the same yesterday, maybe the day before. And all of this makes the words coming out of his lips not just odd, but utterly mystifying. Uh, Jesus called out in a loud, loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his laugh. The centurion, this is verse 46, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Praise God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Hold on. Did he just say that out loud? Like, mate, you're a centurion. Uh, your job is to kill people who say the kind of things that you just said. Your job is to praise Caesar and kill people who refuse to praise Caesar. Not the other way around. He knew exactly what it meant to say these words because he had killed, he had executed dozens of people who had said words like it and died for that. This is more than a moment of, oops, did I say that out loud? Uh, so 
what would make a centurion say these words? Beyond the implication. Well, we're not sure. Maybe he heard the same prayer that the criminal heard. Father, forgive them. Maybe he witnessed this interaction between the criminal and Jesus. He certainly saw the way that Jesus died. And he certainly saw the way the sun stopped shining in the middle of the day. So whatever it was, he realized suddenly that Jesus' death was meaningful enough for him to be willing to risk it all, to grasp for himself. See, in our world, in general, people rely on all sorts of things to deal with the reality of mortality and the uncertainties of life. We, we cling after power, security, comfort. We, we cling to our jobs, we cling to our relationships. Especially a man as acquainted as this man with death. Having seen what he's seen, you would want to be putting as many things between you and death as possible, because he knows. He's done it. And that's why you, you, you'd accumulate power and strength and social standing. That's why you'd want to retain a job like this, where you're, you're fairly protected. You're powerful. You're responsible. So that these were the best answers that he and, and his world offered in response to the threat of death and uncertainty. At least that was until he saw Jesus die on a cross. See, at the feet of the crucified Jesus, this centurion realized that there was something better available to him. So good that these other things that he put between him and death were worth giving up for. For everything he had in life, all the power and the reputation and wealth he accumulated, when he saw the death of Jesus, that was the something else that struck him as more essential than them, something that all these other things could not do for him in the face of death and mortality and, and uncertainty. What the centurion had witnessed in his own words was the righteousness of Jesus on the cross. Surely this is a righteous man. That is, surely his, his justness, his goodness, his perfection, his love. The centurion had seen a bit of vindictive dying criminal discover hope and peace and clarity of mind in the face of death. Uh, the centurion saw the reason. It was because this man had been forgiven by Jesus when he was at his worst. So surely this was a righteous man, said the centurion. In other words, surely Jesus is the one in whom I can find that same clarity and that same freedom and that same buoyancy in life that this criminal found. Surely in Jesus is a man in whom I can have, I can find forgiveness. Surely Jesus is one in whom I can receive the embrace of God, even me. If the criminal can have that, why can't I? And friends, Maybe you're like the criminal. Life is falling apart. Jesus' death is for you. But maybe you're like the centurion. You have it all together. Or at least you're on the way. Or you feel like, just one more step and I'll have it all together. See, you can be moral. You can be a good person. You can have your life together, live in a nice area like Beecroft, have everyone's respect but not have the death of Jesus as your own. And that's not enough. You can attend church or be a good moral person, but it's not enough in the face of our guilt before God and the reality of death. We need Jesus' death to be our own. Because Jesus' death is for everyone. It's the complete answer to guilt. A more complete answer to death to mortality than this world will ever offer because Jesus walked out of the grave. Sorry to spoil it. It's a Sunday, but he did. And proves us, proves to us that we have won an intimacy with God, a God who loves us at our work. Well, it has been won for us on the cross. The centurion observed two dying people coming to grips with who Jesus was. One met Jesus and got insight into the depth of God's love, and he was changed further. The other 
only saw a loser on a cross who was forgettable. And the centurion standing there seeing these two dying men realized he's just another dying man with the same choice that these two dying men have. And really, this is kind of, it's a true story, but it's also a parable for life, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, we are dying men and women. Whether we like it or not, we are dying men and women who need to make a decision about the death of Jesus. Is it forgettable or is it for us? And your answer will change everything. It will change the way you live. It will give you buoyancy in life and hope in death and freedom from being tethered to worldly things, freedom from bitterness so that you can really live. But it will also give you a hope beyond death because you'll be with Jesus in paradise because of Easter Sunday. Jesus' death is for everyone, the broken criminal, the complete centurion, and you. We need it, just like they did. And if we only ask Jesus, please remember me, the answer will, will always be, yes, I will. Why don't we pray? Our Father God, what a wonderful, wonderful thing it is that Jesus died on a cross for the criminal, for the centurion, and for me. Father, we thank you that it won my place in paradise with him. Thank you that there we see that as we get worse, you are more inclined to forgive us. It's not the other way around. May we take that. May it transform us. May we not stay the same as we walk out of this place. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's continue in prayer as we approach God's throne with boldness and thankfulness in our hearts for what Jesus has done for us. We thank you, Lord, for creating this world, for its breathtaking beauty and infinite biodiversity and for sustaining its delicate balance. Yet at the same time, we grieve the destruction of natural disasters and the ugliness of disease. Forgive us, Lord, as we too, in our sinfulness, spoil the word's beauty, reduce its diversity and upset its balance. So help us instead to be its responsible stewards, distributing fairly its bounty between peoples living today and generations coming tomorrow. And we pray for those suffering from sickness or ill health, particularly for those in our own community suffering from illness or recovering from recent operations, and for those suffering mental illness and distress and those in turmoil due to family, breakdown or grief at a lost loved one. Today we especially remember Mano Amarasingham, Vilma Anthony, Oli Arginella, Adrian Binning, Andre Crisis, Clarissa Luxford, Jenny Timms, and Annette White. Lord, grant all these people the peace that only you can give. We thank you, Lord, for the signs of common grace across our world, nation, and communities, for presidents and prime ministers who are truly servant-hearted, for those working in the commercial, medical, educational and artistic spheres who are creating, healing, teaching and inspiring, for those in caring professions or raising children. And yet we are also mindful of too many leaders in power who put their own interests above their peoples. Constrain the hands of such leaders, Lord. Remove them from power. Protect those they try to destroy and abuse. At this time, we especially pray for a ceasefire in Gaza and the provision of desperately needed humanitarian aid. And we pray for an end to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the continuing war in Sudan and many other places. Forgive us too, as we in our willfulness neglect and exploit others, forgetting we are all made in your image. Help us instead to remember our God-given mandate to nurture and protect, especially those most vulnerable in our society and those on the very edge or excluded from it. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the worldwide church and its time. We remember especially those suffering, the millions around the world who are persecuted for their faith, discriminated against, dispossessed of property and livelihoods, imprisoned, tortured, and even killed. And if ever you call us to follow such a path, please, Lord, give us strength to drink such a bitter cup as you drunk and carry such a shameful cross as you carried, that you alone may be glorified. And we pray for all Easter services around the world, including those held in this church on Sunday, that many will come and be challenged and comforted by the news of the risen Lord Jesus. And closing with the prayer for today, merciful God, you have made all people and hate nothing you have made, nor do you desire the death of a sinner, but rather that they should be converted and live. Have mercy on all who do not know you or who deny the faith of Christ crucified. Take from them all ignorance, hardness of heart and contempt of your word and bring them home to your fold, blessed Lord, so that they may become one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The death and burial of Jesus. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they, the women, went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment.
Well, thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you have appreciated today, for the first time or afresh, that God, at our worst, loves us to the utmost by dying on a cross. How could we not be changed by Good Friday and observing the death of Jesus just like the centurion? As you leave, you can give money in the bags for the ministry and mission of St. John's and thanks to all of those who give online. I'll finish with a final blessing. Christ, our crucified Saviour, draw you to himself that you may find in him a sure hope and assurance of sins forgiven and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.